We're back. Welcome to the Constitution Line by Line. I'm Paul Fabrizio. And I'm Don Frazier. We have some errata. <laughs> yes. Uh, how do we say this? The last time it was... When we were talking about naturalization. And bankruptcy. And bankruptcy. That's actually the same clause of the Constitution. So it's part A, part B. Right, of clause 4. So that's clause 4. Now we're going into clause 5. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5. Now we're on 5. All right. And we're talking about the powers of Congress. So Congress shall have the power, here we go, to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and a foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures. This is important. Oh, it's incredibly important. <laughs> Later on, it's going to talk about counterfeiting, so we don't want to talk about that now. We're just talking about coining money. Okay. Do you have some money I could borrow? Don? Well, <laughs> let me go strike some. I'll go out in my garage and see if I can get you some money. Uh, you have any idea where the word dollar comes from? I don't have any idea. actually comes from silver that was mined in Germany. In the dollar region? Yeah, or in the in the dollar. Oh, okay. And so um, this was during the Spanish Habsburg influence in that part of Germany. Mm -hmm. And so the Spanish actually were minting coins that eventually became just slurred into dollars. Mm -hmm. And we did so much commerce within the Caribbean Basin and the Spanish Empire that the dollar became the de facto currency as opposed to English pence and pounds and all that stuff because the British would not let the Americans strike their own coins. Why would they? Well, I mean, from one perspective, why yeah, would they do that? Correct. And that, you know, because if you're trying to control your colonies, why would you want them to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. to strike their own currency? <laughs> yeah. And so uh, what ends up happening is the currency, uh, the de facto currency of colonial America are Spanish dollars. How funny. And that's kind of where the dollar comes from. Huh. Okay. Now. This is something I'd never heard anything about before. Yeah. So, Two so. bits, four bits, six bits. Okay. A dollar. Okay. All right. So you take a dollar yes. and you break it into eight pieces mm -hmm. or pieces of eight. Okay. And that's where you get eight bits making a dollar. Okay. So this is actually a throwback to that early commerce where you would actually take a chip out of a coin, and that would be a bit of a piece of eight. Okay. That would be how you'd make change. As opposed to, like, taking a fifth of something. Correct. That's exactly right. So Spanish dollars are where we get the idea, the concept of pieces of eight. Right. Like, Arg, matey. Yeah. I'm running me fingers through me pieces of eight. Yeah. Well, that's... Spanish dollars. Did you want to be a pirate? No, I don't, I, I, I've come out as decidedly anti-pirate in this uh, series <laughs> of lessons. So, yeah. um, but that's kind of was that was the basis. That was the underlying basis of the American economy in the colonial period, and so that's how come we're on a dollar as opposed to a pound. That always seemed counterintuitive to me. Okay, then since you brought that up and it deals with this same part of the Constitution, why? Did we adopt, unless I'm mistaken, the British system of measurement? Inches, well, because, yards, Yeah, because miles. the British units of measurement were also the Spanish and everybody else's units oh, of measurement. Oh, everybody agreed with yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, it's I, not— I mean, I mean, everybody now is on the metric, and that's a whole other thing. And that was essentially brought in with Napoleon okay. and his European uh, reforms. Okay. And so we have that legacy weights and measures— that was the state of the art. It's almost like um, in that particular realm of American life, it quit developing at the colonial period and just kind of went its own way, even though back in the mother country, mm -hmm. it shifts to the metric system. So, okay, so we keep using, for example, ounces and pounds and miles and everything, yeah. just like the British used to use, but yeah. they no longer do. But we never picked so up stones. So we're stuck. Yeah, well, they, you know, they say that some of the best examples of Elizabethan English are in the United States. It can be heard in Appalachia <laughs> because it's a it's a relic, a remnant of that earlier period. So, 
you know, we never did pick up the concept of stones. Like, oh, she lost a couple of stones. She looks magnificent. You know, every time I read that in a British newspaper, I'm going, I have no idea Thank how God. come everybody over here is stones. But um, the dollars and the weights and measurements come about because the way you made change was by shaving coins or breaking them okay. up. And so you got to make sure that if you're going to conduct commerce, again, this is another commercial aspect of the Constitution, mm -hmm. you have to have some confidence that that piece of eight is actually a piece of eight mm -hmm. and not a piece of nine and a half. Right. So, so you need uniform measures. You need that set up by the government. Yeah. You need to make sure it's actually government issued. That something going on in Massachusetts is the same thing that's going on in South right. Carolina. Now, when the Confederacy came along, they established their own system of currency. Is that correct? They did. And it was fiat what? money. <laughs> so it was based on nothing. It was based on it, nothing, except, and ultimately it was worth nothing. And so it was basically, here, since we have a new government, we're going to just separate ourselves. Now, they're still them. dollars. Okay. Still denominated in dollars. Okay. But they're... But they're based on and they're backed by yeah, the well, confidence they, you have in the Confederacy. Correct. They floated bonds. Okay. And uh, part of what they used to underwrite their bonds, since they were short on gold, they had some gold, but not a lot, is they uh, backed it with cotton. Oh. And that's the whole idea behind King Cotton diplomacy. Okay. And cotton is, you know, got intrinsic value that can serve as collateral when you are securitizing your debt. Okay. So that's why the blockade becomes important, and that's yeah. why the fall of New Orleans is such a big deal. Yeah. Because now all your creditors can't actually lay hands on their collateral. Yeah. <laughs> I need to touch this. Yeah, cotton. I need to touch this stuff that's back in this paper, which looks kind of fishy right now. Yeah. And the whole thing collapsed. And the whole thing collapsed. But that's, that speaks to the idea of why you need currency that people – all trust weights and measures that people all trust right and that builds up to that confidence especially if you're going to float paper that's based on confidence people have to have confidence at almost a molecular level yeah that everything is fair did the south and this is really a historical question yeah did the south really move to the confederate system of dollars or did they continue to use the northern they used, currency? They, yeah, they used whatever currency they could get their hands on because pretty quickly they became currency poor. There wasn't a lot of currency in circulation. Okay. And that became a bit, bit of a problem. And then the Confederates countered this by dumping a lot of Confederate currency <laughs> into the economy, it. just printing oh, it based no. on nothing, which caused rampant inflation. So you would see people say, all right, I will buy this pound of flour, $10 Confederate, $2 U.S. Oh. <laughs> and so you had this discount system going on. And then, you know, I'll give 50 cents in gold. Yeah. <laughs> so there were currency traders. Oh, the currency and traders. And gold and, dealers and silver Absolutely. Dealers. And, and they're dealing. And even commodity trading. You know, you have to have some sort of exchange rate. So how many bushels of corn is a bale of cotton worth? And then right. are we going to— have a cow over here. And, and you know, how are we going to denominate this? Are we going to do this in gold, U.S., or Confederate? And a lot of people went so far in on the Confederacy that they converted all of their liquidity to Confederate currency. Oh, my. And, and were ruined by it. Yeah, they were ruined by the, ruined by the war. Ooh. So okay. that's kind of an aside to what we're talking about here. Right, but, but it shows the importance of this thing. We don't think about it much. To coin money, you know, the U.S. government makes money. And that money's got to be worth something. In the old right. days, it, it was the percentage of precious metals. Right. And now it's just a token. Right. Because all money is, is um, it is transportable wealth right. that replaces stuff that rots and has a storage issue. So... This is just value on wheels. Right. Reducing it to its basic sense. As basic sense. Yeah. So regulate the value thereof. Uh, that's the job 
of the Federal Reserve today. Well, well sure. And, and think about what we use as money. We've got gold and silver. Mm -hmm. So how much silver equals how much gold? I don't know. Because it's fluid. Mm -hmm. So sooner or later, you have to stick a pin in it mm -hmm. and say, all right, you know, a hundred of these equal one of those. But the government moved away from that by getting off the gold standard, getting off the silver standard. Sure. I mean, because that becomes irrelevant. Right. I mean, we used to have silver certificates. Sure. And, and gold certificates. And this was the number one political issue in the late 19th century. Okay. Is the free and unlimited coinage of silver because the United States had tons of silver, but not as much gold. And so people that wanted to loosen up credit saw the idea of let's print just let's strike just a ton of silver coins and that'll put more money in circulation but if you wanted tight credit you wanted to have that gold in reserve mm -hmm. and not have a whole lot of circulation so this became a rich versus poor urban versus rural populist revolt all that sort of stuff is wrapped up in how we regulate the value thereof so accepting all that how do you respond to bitcoins today or other virtual currencies well and it's i mean because in essence there's always been an issue through human history correct with correct, money correct oh absolutely and and really the first money was just a receipt for the no, the amount of grain that was stored right. in somebody's communal silo yeah so it goes all the way back to the distant past. So Bitcoin has the challenge of being universally accepted. So Bitcoin's only worth what people say it's worth. Right. Because it's not based on really anything other than confidence. And how much confidence do you have in where do Bitcoins come from? Well, I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, mean you, there's Bitcoin, you, you, blockchain, all that seems to be. You can mine your Bitcoins and all that stuff. It strikes me as the whole thing is based on nothing except that it's on the Internet. And that people accept it. Yes. And that's the other thing. And then they sell it for real currency. Right. Which... Which means you have an exchange rate. Yeah. Which means that people that go all in on Bitcoin sometimes cry <laughs> <laughs> because the confidence in Bitcoin collapses. Yeah. Would Bitcoins be a foreign coin? Uh, Under the words of the Constitution, to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and of foreign coin? Yeah, I would, think would, it would be. I think sooner or later we're going to have this conversation about what is Bitcoin valued at within the American context. Yeah. And the thing that people like about Bitcoin is it's an offshore way right. of skirting all this. And so it can go sky's the limit. Right. Or it can go... South on the floor. And then nobody's going to be there to pick you up. Right. So it, as much as people bridle by some of the clauses and conditions of the Constitution, there's a lot of protections there. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. There we go. That, the it, monetary system. Here we go. And, and by the way, I just want to make the point again. Regulate the value of their of coin money. In essence, we're talking now that's taken over by the Federal Reserve System um, and their responsibility to control the amount of money in the economy. Yeah, but to, a penny's still a penny, a quarter's still a quarter, right. which is what this is speaking to. Federal Reserve is levering it in or out of the economy, so that's money supply. But when you do that, that has the effect of affecting yes. the value the of that. The de facto money. effect. Yeah. But a quarter still a quarter. quarter. Right, right. Now, the thing that it's pegged to shifts. Right. So in the old days, you could get a piece of candy for a couple of cents. Mm -hmm. Or there was such a thing as penny, penny candy. candy. And now there is not. Yeah. So what Except changed. history. Yeah. <laughs> so what changed then is what its purchasing power is. Right. But a quarter is still a quarter. Right. Still a quarter dollar. So how come the American people don't accept a $2 coin or a dollar coin? Man, I love them. How come Americans don't? Well, because they're just not familiar with them. Americans, I'm going to say this, okay, and everybody's just going to have to like it. Americans are inherently conservative, and they don't like change. 
<laughs> in this <laughs> case, is... they don't like dollar coins for change. <laughs> and also, since you're talking about that, we don't like changing our weights and measure systems either. Correct. Um, go back to when we were growing up, and we're running out of time, I know. Go back to when we were growing up, and there was an effort by Jimmy Carter as president to Let's change go us metric. to the metric system. Yeah. And we actually started to have kilometers and all that stuff. And yeah. then we sort of— Gun range went to meters. Yeah, and then all of a sudden we backed away from that. Yeah. Yeah, because the American people said, nope. It's a political issue, like so many other things Everything. we talk about. Everything is. All right. All right, so that's our line, weights and measures. And coins. Now and coins. And now we're going to go to the next numerator yes. power in the next clause, which will be six, in the Conf next episode. Uh, yes, we'll get to that shortly. <laughs>